one of the things that seems to be true about the universe we live in is that there are no magnetic monopoles. Monopole, what does that mean? So an electric monopole is just a charge, and there are electric monopoles. You can, so monopole, one pole, so a proton, for example, is an electric monopole. Something that has a net positive charge, something that has a net negative charge is a, also an electric monopole. Put the two together, you now have an electric dipole, dipole, two poles. Well, okay, that's great. With mag, but there's no magnetic monopoles. You don't find a north or a south pole floating around by itself. If you did, it would be cool, but we don't. Um, so the most basic magnetic thing is the dipole, really. Um, so we're gonna talk about dipoles, and when thinking about dipoles, sometimes you can figure out what happens with them more easily by thinking of the dipole as a little current loop, because a current loop basically is a magnetic dipole. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do here, by modeling a magnetic dipole as a small square loop of current, right? It's the kind of thing you can do to figure out stuff. Show that the torque on a magnetic dipole, so the torque on a magnetic dipole, M, in magnetic field B is that. Torque equals M cross B. And you're like, what? How would I even do that? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by drawing all the pictures to make sure we know what we're talking about. So let's define B in this direction. So that's B vector. Let's define some axes so that we can talk about it. So B is in the Y direction and Z is in that direction. And now let's make a little loop of current. Well, start by saying here's a magnetic dipole M and notice I didn't make it parallel so that the cross product would not be zero. Remember the cross product of two parallel vectors is zero. So if you use the right hand rule M cross B, so M is that way, B is that way, we expect a plus Z torque if this is right. All right, so but here, but we're just supposed to derive that. So what I'm going to do now is pretend that this M is a little square loop of current. So I'm going to try and draw a square loop of current here, which now comes the disaster of me trying to draw in 3D. I hope I did that right, okay. So it's supposed to look, what's supposed to look like is that this is in front here and that's in back. Um, and then the current is going around like this. Okay, so that's the current. I'm going to say that this current is A by A. And remember that the magnetic dipole moment of something like this is IA squared. The magnitude of the magnetic dipole. That's not a mass, that's a magnetic dipole moment. We use M for different things here. Well, okay, that's great. Um, although I need to redraw this now because foolishly, I didn't tilt it right, so now you get to watch me try and draw in 3D again. I think actually this one should end up... One of these days I'm going to learn the trick for drawing in 3D. Now it should look like this. Yeah, I know. The trick for drawing in 3D is to use my computer to make 3D stuff because it looks so much better. But that takes a lot of time, so all right. So this is supposed to look like it's in front. The current is going around like this. Uh, okay, and so then the magnetic moment would be in that direction, so that matches what we've drawn over there. The way you figure out the direction of the magnetic moment is you use the curly right hand rule. So if I curl my fingers around in the direction of the current, it's going around like that. Look at the way my fingers are pointing, and so my thumb, that's the M there. And now I have uh, the magnetic field B, which I'm just going to draw on four legs. It's everywhere, but it's also on the four legs, like that. Um, great, and so now what I'm going to do is, how do I figure out the torque? Well, what is torque? Remember that torque, in general, is R cross F, where R is the lever arm. What the lever arm means is the displacement from the point you're measuring torques about to where the force is applied. So we'll measure port torques about the center of this thing. That's the natural place to do it. I didn't tell you that, but that's what I wanted you to do. That's great, so we have to figure out the four forces. So let's figure out the four forces on each of the four legs. Well, let's start with the front and back legs. We've done this before. We actually maybe know where this is going. Is that I have a current, I that way, and a magnetic field that way, so it's going to point out of the board here 
Right, so that's, oh my pen is dying, I've probably said that a lot of times now. So that's the force on that leg, points out of the board. That's not going to give you any torque, right? That's trying to pull the whole loop this way, but it's not trying to spin the loop anyway. Similarly back here, current is going that way, B is that way, I cross B, that's into the board. I'm trying to draw in 3D here. All right, so neither of those will give us a torque. We did this in the video last week. We know we will get a torque from these two here though, right? So in this case, the current is coming out of the board and the B is that way, so there's a torque this way. Sorry, a force that way. And that will give us a torque, right? Because if you have a loop that's tilted like this and you pull in this, it's going to try and rotate it that way. And here, current into the board, B up, you get a force this way. Well, okay, very nice. Um, let's figure out what the torque is. So here's the lever arm, and here is that lever arm. So there's two different lever arms, one for each force. So that's the R for that F, and this is the R for that F. Actually, before we do that, let's just write down what is the magnitude of this force. Or in fact, I can even write down the full force because I have my axes there. Well, okay, remember, for this, where you're going to use force is equal to IL cross B. So that's the current, that's the length of the current, that's the magnetic field. Well, so the current is just I. The L in this case is, is um, let's just call it L. No, I called it A before, so we have to call it A. So that's A. Um, great. The, uh, well, all right, so L vector, and I gotta not use the word. L vector, we'll look at just this one to start with. So the one into the board is equal to minus LZ hat, because it's into the board, right? And the magnetic field, is equal to, it's in the y direction, be y hat. So I L cross B, the force in this case, notice, hey, the force and the thing are perpendicular, so the magnitude is just going to be I L B, and it better come out in the plus x hat direction. We're going to do it both ways to make sure, so that it's minus I L Z hat, so that's I L, cross B y hat. So that's equal to minus I L B times Z hat cross Y hat. Z hat cross Y hat, well it's backwards, so it's gonna be negative X hat. Or if I do it looking at my little thing here, Z hat cross Y hat, negative X hat. So this force is just I L B X hat. So this force is I L B X hat. And this force here is I L minus I L B X hat, right? That's in the minus X direction. We did that with the right hand rule. You could also work it out like this. You'd get the same thing. All right, so now we know the forces. What are the lever arms? Well, that one's a little harder because we're at some kind of angle here. Oh, dear. And so now we have to define angles. Well, knowing where we're going, M cross B, let's go ahead and define this angle as theta because then that's the angle between M and B. And then we know that M cross B, the magnitude of M cross B is going to be the magnitude of m times the magnitude of b times sine theta. All right, so if you define that angle as theta, right, so that is theta, well, now we have to figure out what is the angle between this lever arm and f. Is this theta or 90 minus theta? And the answer is it's 90 minus theta. And how do I know that? Um, because I'm wrong. Uh, it's actually theta, right? Because M here, this is perpendicular to this, right? This is a horizontal, and that's perpendicular to M. And then F is horizontal and is perpendicular to the vertical, right? So if I took this angle and I rotated it at 90 degrees, this would go to the direction of F, this M would go to that direction. So this here is just theta, right? And likewise, this is theta. So now I can figure out this torque. Torque equals R cross F. Um, well, I, first of all, I'll do the magnitude first and then I'll worry about the direction. So the, this R here is A over 2, okay? Um, and then F is I, L, B, and then we have sine of the angle between them. So that's the magnitude of it. What is the direction? Well, if you just think about this, this guy, you pull on this side of this loop, it's going to try and spin it like that. So you expect the 
torque to be in the plus z direction. So let's figure that out. Well, r is down, f is that way, down, down. Yep, it's in the plus z direction. All right, so that's the torque. Um, we'll call this leg one. So then if we do the torque for leg two, we're gonna get the same thing. Now let's just make sure the direction is right. So we have R that way and F that way. Sure enough, it's in the plus Z direction. The net torque is the sum of the two. So the total torque is just A, I, oh, I'm being an idiot. Because this L was actually an A, right? Where did I have it? Well, it should, yeah. This, this, oh, I'm mixing up my E's and my L's. And that's very important because I haven't defined an L. Remember, in this equation, that is whatever the length is. Right, this is a general equation here. My length I have defined as A, so I've got to call it A in all these places because that's what it is. All right, A over 2. So notice A over 2 times A, that's A squared over 2. I'm going to add two of them, so I end up with an I, A squared, B, sine theta, Z hat. Okay, that's what the torque is. Um, well, notice this, m b sine theta, and m, we know is i a squared, a squared b sine theta. So, hey, look, the magnitude is right. Let's just check the direction, m cross b, hey, that's in the z direction. So, m cross b, if we do that, is i a squared b sine theta z hat, and that is the same as this. So, therefore, we've shown it. So just to review what I did, I wanted to show this. I set myself up. M cross B, just by looking at what M is and what B is and the angle between them, we figure out the magnitude from the cross product. Use the right hand rule to figure out the direction. This is what M cross B is. Great, but I want to show that's the torque. Well, so I pretend it's a little square loop of current. Then M is this, I A squared, right? It's I times the area of the loop. So I know what M is, I know the direction of M. I use IL cross B on these two legs to figure out the forces because these two legs won't contribute any torque. Then I do torque as R cross F to figure out the torques, work it out and I get exactly the same thing. So I have shown that that is the torque on a magnetic dipole, M vector in a magnetic field, B vector. So you put a, a magnetic dipole in a field and it's just gonna have a torque on it. And it's gonna depend on the angle between them. Uh, so that's all pretty exciting. Now the one other thing is I could have, if I had wanted, looked at this little r vector here, right, and notice that the angle between that and the horizontal is theta, right, so this r vector for this force, so this is the one I called r1, I could have written that as um, a over 2 cosine theta and a over 2 sine theta are the lengths, right, because this length is A over 2, so adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine theta. I could have written R1 is equal to A over 2 cosine theta x hat minus A over 2 sine theta y hat, right? I could have written that and then plugged that in here with this force, and I would have ended up with the same thing. Um, instead, I use the fact that I know that the cross product's magnitude is the sign of the angle between, and I use the right hand rule to figure out the vectors. Either way of doing it is fine. Anyway, that's the first problem. Consider a charged particle with positive charge Q. We're going to think about the force on this charged particle at various different distances from the origin. So I'll we'll place the origin there. I will place my charged particle here. I would say the distance from the origin is r. And because we're just talking about distance, I have the freedom to just line it up along whatever axis I want. So I'm going to say that it's lined up along the x-axis, x and y axis. And then there are two possibilities for what is at the origin. Either we have at the origin a positive charge Q, capital Q, or we have a dipole with dipole moment P. So I've drawn them both here, but only one or the other is there. And what I want to do is make a plot of the strength, so just the magnitude of the electric force on our test charge as a function of distance from the origin. 
Well, all right. Let's just say that force we know is going to be equal to QE, and Q is the same in either case. So what really matters is the magnitude of the electric field. So if capital Q is at the origin, we know that the magnitude of the electric field is just KQ over R squared. We did that a long time ago. If it's a dipole, and this is what I told you in class today, uh, although we kind of rushed through it at the end, but if you look at the notes, you can see, see here's the notes, see? If you look at them, you can see that the, the magnitude of the electric field is equal to K times P, the, the dipole moment, divided by R cubed. That works in the XY plane, so I've just decided to go off in this direction. It'd be a little different in other directions. The important thing here is that the point charge falls off as 1 over r squared, and this falls off as 1 over r cubed. Now, q and p don't have the same magnitude. They can't even have the same units. But they're going to be a constant. So what really matters is this 1 over r squared versus 1 over r cubed. Otherwise, there's just a couple of constants on top. So here's what I'm going to do to get a sense of how to plot this. Is I'm going to think about a bunch of different distances. So I'm going to say r over r naught, where r naught is some reference distance, which could be, say, 1 meter. And I'm going to then calculate what is 1 over r squared. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this is r. I'll go ahead and put units on it. I'll say r, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say r, 1 over r squared, and 1 over r cubed. Um, and what I'm going to do is inst I'm going to do a unitless r. You say, that's wrong. r has to come in meters. That's why I wanted to put in this r naught thing. It's going to be number of r naughts. So what this r really is number of r naught. So if you don't like that, you can think of this as r over r naught. And instead of 1 over r squared, you can think of this as r naught squared over r squared. And this is r naught cubed over r cubed. But then r naught is just a constant, so it amounts to the same thing. And so then I'll, let's just pick a few different r's, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? So it's like at this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point. At those five points, I'm going to calculate 1 over r squared, and then I know that the electric field from the point charge will be just proportional to that, because I multiply each one of them by kq, and then the r naught is necessary. Same thing for the 1 over r cubed, I multiply it by kp. So let's just do these. Well, 1 over r squared for 1 is 1. 2 squared is 4, so this is 0.25, which is 1 fourth. 3 squared is 9. So 1 ninth is 0 0.111. 4 squared is 16th is, is 16. 1 16th is 0 0.0625. And 5 squared is 25. And um, what is 1 25th is 0 0.04, I think, is 1 25th. Because if I multiply the top and bottom by 25, 4 times 25 is 100. Yeah, that's right. I'm not going to be able to do all the cubes in my head. So that's what you get. Just calculate these out. 1 over r cubed. Hey, it's also 1. Um, 2 cubed is 8, so this is 0.125. You can see already it's dropping off faster. 3 cubed is 27. I can't do 1 27th in my head. 4 cubed is 2 to the 6, 64. I can't do 1 64th in my head. And 5 cubed is 125. I can't do 1 over 125 in my head. So what I'm going to do is do those on my calculator and come back and write them up. 037 is 1 over 3 cubed. We get 0 0.016 is 1 over 4 cubed. 0 0.008 is 1 over 5 cubed. All right. So now what we can do is we can plot both of these together. And so what I'm going to plot is, uh, this is just the strength of the electric field. So we have to, let's just start with, in case it's Q. So I'll we'll plot that one in blue. Um, so we know the electric field is going to be proportional to 1 over R squared. So what I'm going to do is scale this here so that this is whatever the electric field happens to be there. And we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right, so that's this. And then here's 1 half, 1 quarter, 1 eighth. So this is 0 0.125, 0 0.25, 0 0.5. Uh, this would be better on graph paper, but fine. So then at 2, it's 0.25. So that's here. At 3, it's 0.111. So that's like here. 
at 4, it's 0 0.0625, which is exactly half of this, which is like that. And at 5, it's 0 0.04, so that's like a third of this, kind of, so that's like that. All right, so these are these points. So it's actually really a, a smooth curve. I'm going to retire this blue pen like this, if I had plotted it. I wanted as best I could. And bye-bye, blue pen. And now let's try and do it. I'll use red to match that. We're going to try and do it for the one over R cubed. So again, we have a 1 here. Then at 2, we're at 0.125. So we're here. And at 3, we're at 0.037. So that's eh, it's a little less than a third of this. And at 4.016, we're getting really tiny. And 0.008, really tiny. So if I do this one, it would look like this. So this is the dipole case. Assuming we've chosen the magnitudes of the dipole and the charge so that they have the same field um, this distance, which means that the dipole is actually stronger here, which means the dipole's got to be really monstrous compared to the electric charge. That's the dipole case, and this is the point charge case. All right, now we will often say the dipole drops off faster with distance than the point charge does. What does that mean? That just means that as you go distance, it gets closer to zero faster. Like 1 over r cubed, you can see. A given distance, if you start the same, boom, this, as you double the distance, this one goes down by more than that one does. You double the distance again from 0.25 to 0.111. That's a little less than half. 0.125 to 0.037. Well, half would be like 0.06. So it's, it's going down more. If you double the distance, the field goes down by more. So it falls off faster for the dipole. As you get farther and farther and farther from the dipole, the field goes to zero faster than it does with the point charge. Right? And so that's what that plot would look like. So that is the second question. We could do the same thing with the magnetic field, except we never have magnetic monopoles, so you never actually get a field falling off as one over R squared from a little isolated thing. If you have a big old infinite wire, it's a whole different ball of wax. But from a little tiny isolated thing that you can get far away from, that we don't have anything in nature that'll give us a one R over R squared field for magnetics. What we do for electrics, but then dipoles, we can get over one of our R cubed for both of them. All right, that was the second problem. Make the assumption that the magnetic dipole moment of a single iron atom comes from three electron spins that are all aligned with each other. Iron actually has 26 electrons, the other 23 are all oriented in such a way that their spins all cancel each other out, leaving no net magnetic moment, right? So you know that probably know from chemistry, that you draw electrons up and down, and so there's 26, but then you have three at the end that all happen to be lined up the same way. So these all can't, because for every up, you're going to have a down. So those all cancel each other out, and then you have those three left over. Okay, if you have a 10 gram refrigerator magnet, I don't know if I spelled refrigerator right, so you have a 10 gram or an 0.01 kilogram magnet, if all of the iron atoms have their magnetic moments alike, what would the overall magnetic dipole moment of the magnet B. All right, so what we have to do, basically we know um, the, the magnetic moment of one electron, we'll call M sub E, is, and I, didn't, I certainly don't have this number memorized, but I gave it to you in class, is 9.285 times 10 to the minus 24 Coulomb meter squared per second. That's the magnetic dipole moment of one electron. So the magnetic dipole moment of one iron, uh, and this is just in magnitude, I'm not going to give a direction on these. We're going to assume it's all in the same direction. The magnetic dipole moment of one iron is 3 m sub e because there's three electrons all lined up. All the rest cancel out each other. That's good. Um, and so then the magnetic dipole moment of your whole sample is going to equal the total number of iron atoms times the magnetic moment of one iron atom, assuming they're all lined up with each other. If they weren't, they would cancel each other out. But now we're assuming they're all lined up with each other. That's right. Um, how many iron atoms do we have? Well, that's a harder question. But we can figure that out because we know the mass of the thing. And the mass of your sample, why don't I use, <laughs> now we're using M for different things. I'm going to use capital M for mass, lowercase m for magnetic moment. The mass of the sample is just equal to the number of iron atoms times the mass of one iron atom. And then the mass of one iron atom is um, 
Do I tell you this? I don't tell you this. I think it's 56. I'm going to assume it's 56. So it's NFE, or rather NFE is equal to M over MFE, which is equal to 0.0, I'm going to stay in grams for reasons, 10 grams divided by 56 atomic mass units, all right, times, and this is actually a number you know because it's Avogadro's number, um, uh, one atomic mass unit is 6.02 times 10 to the minus 23rd um, grams, right? So now I know uh, the number of iron atoms, and so therefore the total mass, oh, that's, that's this. So now I can get, take this number, NFE, multiply it by this number, and I will have that number, the total magnetic dipole moment of the whole thing. So let's write that out. That's M, I put in the 10 grams over 56 AMU with the unit conversion. One AMU is equal to, oh, I did this wrong, I apologize. It's 6.02 times 10 to the plus 23 AMUs, atomic mass units, is one gram. Right, that's really what Avogadro's number is. So we have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd AMU per gram times the magnetic moment. So this is a magnetic moment or magnetic dipole moment of our whole chunk of iron, our whole 10 grams of iron. So that's the number of iron atoms times the magnetic moment of one iron, which is three times three times 9.285, horrible space management, times 10 to the 24 Coulomb, 10 to the minus 24, that's pretty important, Coulomb meter squared per second. All right, so if I can draw a box around this so you can see, that's what it is. I'm gonna stick that in my calculator, and we get, check this out, 3.0. Did I do that right? 3.0, um, it's actually 3.00 even, I think. No, it's 2.99. How sad, I'm just gonna call it 3.0 because I feel good about that. I know I should keep extra digits for intermediate numbers, but deal with it. Coulomb meter squared per second. Okay, that is the um, magnetic dipole moment of this little 10 gram chunk of iron. So it's like a little tiny fridge magnet. Next question is what is the magnetic field? What do I say? A centimeter away, what is the magnetic field? Uh, half a centimeter away. So it's like the size of a fridge, like at the edge of the magnet. What is the magnetic field? Well, so what I'm going to do is we'll assume that, you know, here's our little cylinder frig fridge magnet. Here's the magnetic dipole moment, and we want to calculate the field there. So let's say it's along Z. So I'm going to use this expression. I'm actually looking at the notes here that the magnetic field is equal to mu naught over 2 pi times the magnetic moment divided by Z cubed. And so the magnitude of the magnetic field. You'll just have to put all these things in. Oh, I have to look up mu naught, I forgot it. So mu naught is four pi times 10 to the minus seven Tesla meters seconds per coulomb divided by two pi. The magnetic moment is 3.0 coulomb meters squared per second. And then Z cubed is 0 0.005, so half a centimeter cubed. And so if I calculate all of those things, I get 4.8. And let's make sure the units work. So coulombs cancel coulombs, seconds cancel seconds, meters cubed cancels meters squared times meters. Yes, we get Tesla. So 4.8 Tesla, that's a lot. Your average real fridge magnet doesn't have that gigantic magnetic field. But this tells you for in iron, what is the biggest magnetic field you conceivably could have at the edge of your free magnet would be about that. Real ones, quite a bit less than that. Um, all right, that's the third problem. Two magnetic dipoles are oriented in the plus z hat direction. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make x this way and I'm gonna make z that way. For that to work, x cross y equals z, y has to be into the board. All right, so here's one magnetic dipole, M1, here's the other, M2, except they both have the same magnetic dipole moment. 
Uh, it doesn't matter, actually. And they're oriented in the plus z direction. They're separated from each other along the x-axis. That's the way I've drawn it. Will the force between them be attractive, repulsive, or zero? And I'll tell you what. All of this is repulsive. I'm going to turn the lights on so you can see better. Yay, light. Okay. No, 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 it's not repulsive at all. It's exciting and stimulating. So good. Here's what I suggest you do. Um, consider this magnetic night magnetabacaba. This magnetic dipole is a loop of current using the curly right hand rule. Right, so here we're here's the back side there. I've like cut it in half, so there's the other half here. You know what? I'm gonna try and draw the whole thing. We'll consider it as like a little, and I'll do a square loop of current just because that's um, easier to, does that look like a square loop of current? One of these days I'm going to have to, no, that looks worse. Whatever, fine. It's a little square loop of current. That's the back. This is the front. By the curly right hand rule, that means that I goes like this. Right, that's the little I. And so here's the question. Is the force between the two dipoles none attractive repulsive? I suggest treating this as a loop of current. Well, here's the thing. What does the magnetic field from this dipole look like? We know that it's along, if they're separated by the x-axis, the magnetic field of the first dipole, so we're going to call this B1, is going to be in that direction. We also know that it gets smaller with distance. I'm sort of exaggerating it, right? It gets really small there. It gets smaller with distance. So that's why I've drawn this arrow biggest, the arrows on these two legs in the middle, smaller and that arrow, the smallest. And now let's consider the forces on all four of these legs. Well, just remember the force is I L vector cross B vector. L is the length, the vector points in the direction of the current. So in this case, the current's coming out of the board. So I L cross B, that is a force that way. So this is the force on that one. On this far one, it's going into the board, I L cross B. It's a force this way, but it's smaller. So already you can see, hey, it's going to be um, repulsive. The two are going to push each other away because this force is bigger than that. Let's think about the ones on the side. Well, in this one, I L cross B, the force is this way, and it's medium. And the one coming here, I L that way, cross B that way, the force is this way. So the two sides, the force will cancel each other out. So there's no side-to-side -side sliding going on. So if you have two magnetic dipoles like this that are lined up the same way, they will actually push each other apart. You may actually have had this experience if you have two bar magnets. Um, if you flip them over, they boom, stick right to each other. But if you have them lined up the same way, they actually repel, although what usually happens is they end up pushing down on the lining. But if you keep them lined up like this, they will repel. And you can figure that out just by looking at pretending one of these dipoles is a little loop of current, which is a fine model for a magnetic dipole, and figuring out the force. The actual law for what is the force of a magnetic field on a dipole is kind of complicated. It involves a derivative. It's not simple like the torque thing we saw earlier. But to figure out the direction, you can do something like this. So there you go. That's it for this week.